Great. Thanks so much. Thanks for inviting me and thank you all for coming. Um, so yeah, my name is James. I'm one of the many philosophers of physics uh, here in Oxford. Um, and as you know, today I'm going to be talking about some issues in the foundations of quantum mechanics. I would say to those of you who are doing um, single honors physics in Oxford, don't forget that you can study this stuff as a short option. So if you're interested, yeah, you could consider doing that. Okay, um, so quantum mechanics. Uh, in my abstract, I gave a quote from Richard Feynman, which says, if you think you understand quantum mechanics, then you don't understand quantum mechanics. Uh, and I think that this is representative of a certain kind of mystique, uh, which has developed around quantum mechanics over the past hundred years. It's become sophisticated to think that you can't understand quantum mechanics or is beyond human understanding. Um, but I think this is somewhat unfair. So physicists have been thinking very hard about how to make sense of quantum mechanics for the last hundred years. Um, and they've come up with lots of, well, lots of sophisticated and very smart proposals of different ways to understand what quantum mechanics is telling us about the world. Um, and what I want to do today is basically just to pre present to you some of the most popular options on this menu of ways of understanding quantum mechanics. Um, I can give further references for those of you who are interested in certain uh, aspects of this. Um, I should also say that I welcome questions and discussion throughout. So I don't know if, uh, if people post it in the chat and there's something that I don't know if the moderators can maybe flag things or maybe if people can just jump in if they've got, they've got questions. Okay, so um, the first thing to say is that quantum mechanics is often presented as being a theory describing macroscopic, uh, microscopic phenomena. Um, but I think it's better understood as a framework which is suitable for the description of both microscopic and macroscopic phenomena. Um, and indeed, it's the when one tries to apply it to macroscopic phenomena that all of the conceptual deep issues with quantum mechanics seem to arise. So what I want to do first today is to just remind you of the kind of structure of quantum mechanics, the mathematical structure of quantum mechanics. Uh, anyone that studied this at all will be completely familiar with the first things that I'm going to talk about today. Um, and then I'll talk to you about how this mathematical structure leads fairly straightforwardly on to uh, certain deep conceptual issues. And these are the conceptual issues which uh, some people have said can't be resolved and that's reflected in the Feynman quote, um, but other people have said can be resolved in such and such a way or such and such a other a way. Um, and I'll go on to talk about those resolutions. Okay, so the first thing to talk about then is what we might call the structural, I'm sorry that uh, it's not very high resolution, but I think you get the idea. Structural core of quantum mechanics. Um, so it has really three aspects. So the first is states. I hope this is legible. I think you get the idea. So this is the possible states of quantum mechanics are represented by vectors in a Hilbert space. Today, we can take a Hilbert space to be a complex valued uh, vector space with an inner product. Uh, there are certain extra completeness conditions, blah, 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 but we don't need to worry about them. So you've got this vector space, you've got a vector in this space. This vector represents a particular state of the physical system that you're looking at. So it might represent the spin of an electron, say, if I'm looking at the spin of a, if I'm discussing the spin of such a particle. Um, but I could think about Hilbert spaces associated with the position of particles and other physical quantities. The second is, observables. And this says to any physical quantity, there is an associated uh, self adjoint operator O on the same Hilbert space that was introduced up here. And the idea is that these operators are going to tell you certain physical quantities associated with the states that I introduced in part one. So that, for example, the time independent Schrodinger equation, I act with the operator, which is the Hamiltonian on my state, and it tells me what the energy associated with that state is. So that's observables. And then the third thing which we might input 
uh, is dynamics. And this is that the state of a quantum system um, evolves over time. according to the time dependent Schrodinger equation, which is I H bar D of psi by DT is equal to H hat, which is the Hamiltonian of psi. So uh, this is my state. I know how the state evolves in time uh, in, as given by this equation, which is the time dependent Schrodinger equation. Uh, if I have the state at some time, I can act on it with the Hamiltonian, and I can find out by solving this equation how the state is going to behave at future times. So I've got my states. I've got a way of associating with them certain physical properties, um, and I've got a way of saying how the state evolves over time. Like I said, uh, anyone that studied uh, quantum mechanics uh, will be familiar with these things from the first few lectures. Um, if this isn't familiar to you, then don't worry too much. This is about as mathematical as it gets, uh, but this is just the appropriate background for today. Okay, so if I take that to be the structural core of quantum mechanics, then I can ask myself, what can I do with this structural core? Uh, and what does it tell me about how certain physical systems will evolve? The troubles arise when I start to try to model measurement interactions themselves in quantum mechanics. So how do I measure model measurement in quantum mechanics? Well, suppose that I've got some experimental setup. Uh, I can't uh, fill in too many of the details here. Being a philosopher of physics, I kind of moved into this discipline because theoretical physics was too applied for me, but you get the idea. This is a, uh, a measurement setup. And I'm measuring the properties of some system, let this be an electron. And I'm going to be measuring the spin of this electron. So if I want to model what's going on here, I might associate with this measurement device an initial quantum state, uh, R0. This is just the state of the measurement device in its ready state, its initial state. Um, and then suppose I'm measuring spin in a stern gerlach experiment, and suppose that the spin of this electron is spin up along the z-axis. Then if I started off with this, this would be the uh, initial state of the combined system, so just the ready state of the measurement device and then uh, the electron being spin up. The time dependent Schrodinger equation will tell me if this is a uh, if this is any good as a measurement device, that after the measurement, the measurement device will record spin up uh, and the spin of electron will still be spin up. Um, I guess there's one caveat here, which I'm going to mention, but which I'm not going to make too much of, which is, in fact, it's not invariably the case that measurements preserve the state of the thing that you're measuring. It might be that by measuring what the spin of an electron is, I have fried the electron or uh, I've modified its state. That's fine. As long as the device has recorded what the state of the spin state of the electron was, uh, we can say this is still a good measurement. So I might if I were to be more general, put not just spin up along the z-axis as the post-measurement state of the system, but I might put like a function of spin up to say it's perhaps something else. Um, but I'm not going to worry too much about that. This is the difference, by the way, between repeatable and non-repeatable experiments. OK, so suppose instead that the electron were in a spin down state, then by similar reasoning, I would get this. The measurement device tells me the electron is spin down and then the spin of the electron is down. But as we, uh, well, as we all who have studied quantum mechanics know, quantum mechanics also, uh, in light of the fact that states are uh, vectors in a Hilbert space, we know that we're allowed uh, physical states to be superpositions uh, of these uh, classically comprehensible states. So I can also imagine, in other words, doing a measurement of an electron which is in a superposition spin state like this. So it's in a superposition of being uh, spin up and being spin down. These states are novel uh, as compared with 
uh, classical mechanics, but they exist in quantum mechanics and we deal with them all the time. Uh, and we measure systems which are in these states all of the time. And that's what I'm modeling here. Now, uh, what I can do in light of the linearity of quantum mechanics is I can push this uh, state of the measurement device through into the brackets. And then I can consider how this will evolve in accordance with the Schrodinger equation. And the first term will evolve to this and the second term will evolve to this. So after the measurement, this will become one over root two. By the way, I'm including this to make sure my states are normalized. Uh, one over root two are up, spin up, plus R down, spin down. Um, and it's here that people kind of hit upon conceptual troubles when they were doing quantum mechanics in the first half of the 20th century. So when I measure a electron, a, the spin of an electron, when that electron is in a superposition state in a stern galactic device, what I'll find is that the electron does not, well, it's hard to make sense of what this is. What I find in my experiments is that the electron will be found to be in the spin up state half of the time, and it will be found to be in the spin down state half of the time. But naively speaking, this doesn't seem to be what's represented by this state. This state seems to be telling me that there's some kind of macroscopic superposition between the electron being spin up and my device recording spin up and the electron being spin down and the device recording spin down. The structural core of quantum mechanics doesn't give me that last step. It said nothing about probabilities. It said nothing that I would about that I would find the spin of the electron in this state half of the time and that I would find the spin of the electron in this state half of the time. So in other words, it seems like what I've presented as being the structural core of quantum mechanics doesn't suffice yet to recover the outcomes of quantum mechanical experiments, uh, and in particular, the probabilistic outcomes, which we are very familiar with having done many of these quantum mechanical experiments. Um, and so the structural core of quantum mechanics uh, has some conceptual troubles. This can be codified in what you might call the measurement problem. which is that you can't have the following three things all at once. By the way, a great paper on this, for those of you who are interested, is called Three Measurement Problems by Tim Maudlin, who's one of the world's leading philosophers of physics. Um, okay, so you can't have the following three things all together. First of all, you can't have it that the quantum state is a complete representation of reality. The second is that uh, states evolve according to the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. And the third is that there are deterministic outcomes or determinate outcomes of measurements. This is lagging out, but... Okay. So, um, what I've done on the previous slide is I've assumed that the quantum state is a complete representation of reality and I've assumed that the time dependent Schrodinger equation is correct. Um, but it seems like that hasn't given me results which actually accord with the outcomes of quantum mechanical experiments because it hasn't given me a determinate measurement outcome. It hasn't told me that I'll see this half of the time and this half of the time. It's just told me this, this hard to make sense of state is what my system will arrive at post measurement. On the other hand, uh, so that's why it doesn't seem like these two things are consistent with there being determinate measurement outcomes. Um, so I might be inclined to either say that the quantum state is not a complete representation or representation of reality. Maybe there's more stuff in reality which allows me to pick out uh, one of these two things as being uh, the right outcome or the outcome which I actually see, but that's not encoded in the quantum mechanical state itself. Uh, or I can say that the time dependent Schrodinger equation isn't correct. Maybe there's some other dynamics, maybe some dynamics which kicks in on measurement. Uh, we're going to talk about that uh, next. Um, so you can't have all of these three things at once. Um, these two things are inconsistent with this. Is this sounding okay to people so far? Maybe I'll pause for questions quickly here. I don't know how you normally do this. I'm also happy to just carry on. 
if someone has a question, pop it in the chat. It's probably sure. easiest while we're talking. Um, okay. Yeah, feel free to bucket it if someone has one. I'll and let at you. the end, we'll do a Q&A where people, if they want to, can also ask um, just uh, via the microphone because it's probably easier to ask those sort of questions. Yep. But if anyone right now wants to interrupt, I don't see anything in the chat. Um, cool. I'll, do you want yep. me? Oh, someone has posted something. Can you just go over quickly the physical interpretation of the superposition post-measurement state? I think that's what you've got to go into. Exactly, yeah. The point is that it's hard to make sense of this thing. Uh, basically, the whole challenge is I don't really know how to interpret this physically, and it doesn't seem to represent what we actually see. And so basically, whoever asked this is actually hitting on the right thing. This is what people thought when they were first developing quantum mechanics, that this can't be the whole story because it's hard to make sense uh, physically of this thing. Um, and so basically everything I'm going to be talking about from here on is going to be answering your question, hopefully. Great. Um, no one else has interrupted so far. Okay, so. cool. Um, good. So what did people do when they hit this problem? Um, you know, this is, to, this is basically the Schrodinger cat issue. Like I've got the superposition of a cat being alive and dead and what am I meant to make sense? How am I meant to make sense of this? Um, one of the things which some of the first luminaries in quantum mechanics suggested is that maybe, uh, this second thing, the time dependent Schrodinger equation being correct, isn't the whole story. Maybe quantum mechanical systems evolve according to the time dependent Schrodinger equation sometimes, but not always. Um, and what people like Dirac and von Neumann suggested is that maybe in addition to the Schrodinger equation, there's another law of quantum mechanics, which we could call the collapse law. Um, and this says essentially that when I perform a measurement or when anyone performs a measurement, the quantum state collapses from being this superposition, this thing, to just one of the two terms in the superposition with probabilities given by the Born rule, which is that the probability of collapsing onto this term or this term is given by the modular squared of its amplitude, which in this case is just going to be half in each case. Um, in that way, you would have seemingly bridged the gap between this problematic state and determinate and probabilistic outcomes. And this is what we get uh, taught when we do quantum mechanics as well. So we'll get taught the collapse law in addition to what I've called the structural core of quantum mechanics. If I were to write the collapse law out, it would be this. Suppose one is measuring, ah, well, one is measuring uh, some quantity, O hat, uh, with associated, oh, sorry, just O, with associated uh, QM quantum mechanical operator O hat. Uh, immediately after measurement, Uh, the QM system collapses um, onto some eigenstate of O. With probability given by the Born rule. And the first thing to say is that this collapse law uh, as a supplementation of the structural core of quantum mechanics is completely fine for all practical purposes. This is why essentially I think many physicists are just not concerned with what I'm going to go on to say. Uh, this is completely fine as a heuristic which will correctly predict the outcomes of quantum mechanical experiments almost all of the time. You could say that quantum mechanics plus the collapse law is uh, perfectly adequate for all practical purposes. Um, but you might still think that we should aspire to do better. So if I look at the collapse law, there are both um, conceptual and technical infelicities. The first thing to point out is this term measurement. So immediately after measurement, the quantum system collapses onto some eigenstate. But no one has told us uh, what a measurement is. 
Um, and this seems in unacceptable from the point of view of a theory, which is meant to be a fundamental description of reality. Why am I invoking such vague and murky terms as measurement? Um, so yeah, what counts as a measurement? Uh, what kind of system interacting with some other kind of system um, suffices for there to be a measurement and so for the quantum mechanical collapse to kick in? Uh, you know, you get all of these discussions like, um, could an amoeba collapse the wave function or would you have to wait a bit longer till someone with a PhD came along to do it? Um, these don't seem like the kinds of questions which we should be asking in a fundamental physical theory. Uh, it's also the case that I think this has led to a lot of confusion when it comes to discussions of consciousness and quantum mechanics generally. People have the idea that, you know, quant consciousness is fundamentally tied up with being able to perform a measurement and so being able to uh, instigate quantum mechanical collapse. Uh, and these are all uh, very controversial, subjective, and I think unpalatable things to be saying in a fundamental physical theory. So even though quantum mechanics plus the collapse law is perfectly adequate for all practical experimental purposes, um, conceptually it's problematic. There's also some technical issues. I'll just mention one of them, which comes back to something which I said before. So the collapse law, as I've written it here, says that immediately after measurement, the quantum mechanical system collapses onto some eigenstate of O uh, with probability given by the Born rule. So if I'm thinking about uh, my spin measurement of the electron, it will either collapse onto the uh, spin up state or the spin down state post measurement. Um, but this assumes that this, by the way, which is called the projection postulate, assumes that um, our measurement doesn't disturb the state. Um, I said before that in general, it will be the case that when I measure some system and I measure the state of the system, the state of that system isn't necessarily preserved on measurement. Um, in other words, the projection postulate is not invariably true. And so it doesn't seem like the kind of thing which we should be assuming when we write down the collapse law. Uh, at the best, then, we would need to revise the collapse law to account for this technical problem. But even then, the conceptual issues to do with measurement would still remain. And so, uh, essentially, all of the issues in the philosophy and the foundations of quantum mechanics arise here. This proposal for a collapse law was written down by people like Dirac. Uh, it's fine for all practical purposes, but it is not fine conceptually. Can I replace it with something uh, which is conceptually cleaner which doesn't have the same uh, issues um, and which sheds more light on what the structure of quantum mechanics is and how I can recover the probabilistic outcomes of quantum mechanical experiments in a way that I don't seem to be able to do from using just the structural core of quantum mechanics. Um, so in the remainder of today's talk, I'm gonna give you three of the most popular approaches uh, to quantum mechanics, which replace this collapse law, this murky, unhappy collapse law with something better. Uh, just as a literature reference here as well, a great paper uh, discussing the collapse law is John Stuart Bell, very famous physicist, notable for the Bell inequalities about quantum mechanics and locality. Maybe we'll have a bit of time to talk about those later. Bell's paper against measurements lays this out, I think, extremely convincingly. So uh, it's quite short. Uh, I'd recommend that to all of you. Good. Um, okay. I think somebody put a question in the chat. Yeah. It says, how to differentiate collapse law with the hidden variables as explained by Einstein, if you want. Uh, I'm going to talk about hidden variable theories as well. So don't worry, I think I'm going to answer your question. Uh, in brief, hidden variable theories don't say that the state collapses at all but they introduce extra structure, which picks out one of the terms in that superposition a few pages ago as being the right one. Um, but this will make more sense um, in 20 minutes or so, I guess. Uh, but it's a good question. Cool. So um, were there any other questions? On the chat? OK, nice. Um, right, let me list out the tension that I wrote before. So the first commitment was that psi is a complete description of reality. The second is that the time dependent Schrodinger equation is always correct. And the third was that there are determinate 
measurement outcomes. And we said how the um, second might be revised if you buy into a collapse postulate. Um, the first of the approaches to quantum mechanics, which I'm going to talk about, and by the way, in the three that I'm going to talk about today are first of all, dynamical collapse theories. Second, uh, what came up in this question, hidden variable theories. And the third uh, is the many worlds interpretation. Um, the first of these proposals, the dynamical collapse theories, attempts to roll with the ideas which were presented in the collapse postulate, but to make them more physically precise and acceptable and to not appeal to this murky notion of measurement. So these dynamical collapse theories will also reject this second of the two, three thing, of, of the two of the three things which together are incompatible. Um, and I'm going to tell you how that works. Uh, just looking ahead a bit, uh, hidden variable theories, as I just mentioned, they would deny that the first thing is right. They would deny that uh, the quantum state is a complete description of reality. They would, they would say that there are other degrees of freedom which break the symmetry between the two terms of that superposition, position, which I wrote down. Um, few slides ago. The many worlds interpretation um, in a sense tried to have its cake and eat it by saying that you can have uh, that odd state um, but nevertheless there are determinate measurement outcomes and there are probabilistic outcomes. Um, I'll pause before I say anything else about that or I will not say anything else about that just yet. Okay so our dynamical collapse theories So the most famous dynamical collapse theory is a theory which is uh, known as the garadi ramini weber theory, or the GRW theory for short. And this supplements the time-dependent Schrodinger equation um, with another law of physics, a collapse law, which says that even though a, the state of a quantum system evolves according to the Schrodinger equation, it also has any a very small chance at any one particular time of collapsing um, onto a particular um, region of configuration space. Oops. So consider a situation like this, ah. where this is my wave function, my state, uh, and imagine that I'm considering position. So. I'm considering some quantum mechanical system, which is essentially in a superposition of being uh, over here or over there. Uh, if I started out with um, a well isolated system uh, in, uh, in position, Schrodinger evolution would generally say that this state would spread out over time. Um, now I'm considering a state which is just in a superposition of these two, of something like two of this. So I have this. Um, this is something that this quantum mechanical state might tell me about uh, the state of a system with respect to its position. It could be in a superposition of being over here or being over there. Um, and that's bad because it will lead to the same kinds of superpositions which we saw uh, a few slides ago. We don't really know how to make sense of such superpositions. The GRW collapse law tries to get around this by saying at any particular time the state has a certain chance of collapsing onto a certain uh, region in this, in this uh, or position, if I'm thinking about this, but in general, a region of configuration space, uh, which is the space of possible states of your system. Um, and that law is given by the Born rule of prob the Born probability rule. So the system has a quite small probability of collapsing onto here. The system has a bigger probability of collapsing onto here. Um, so post post collapse, GRW collapse, what I will do is I will take some Gaussian function and I will multiply it by my wave function. So my original wave function, my original quantum state goes to my Gaussian given by the GRW collapse times the, times the state. And that's my new state. 
And you can see that if I multiply that original state by such a Gaussian, if it originally looks like this, after multiplying it by a Gaussian, it will look like this. I will have suppressed one of the two terms. So an original state, which I could maybe write like this, this could be the superposition of the two position states of my system, will evolve post-collapse to say epsilon alpha, where epsilon is very small, plus one minus epsilon beta. Okay, so there's still more to say. So this is how uh, GLW introduces an extra probabilistic dynamics to um, the Schrodinger equation. It says that even though a quantum mechanical system evolves according to the Schrodinger equation, it has a very small probability of collapsing, i.e. being hit by a certain Gaussian at any given point. Now, the chance of an individual um, or the time scale to be hit by such a Gaussian for an individual microscopic quantum mechanical system is stipulated to be very low. So if I consider an electron, um, or which is in a superposition of these two position states, just to move from spin to position, the chance of this process happening is very, very low. And so the chance of the electron collapsing dynamically, given the GRW dynamics onto something like this, uh, is very, very low. However, um, the GRW collapse law applies to all particles uh, in the universe. And because there are, when I go back, right back to my odd state, because this measurement device will consist of, I don't know, something like 10 to the 30 particles, um, the chance of any one of those particles collapsing um, becomes very high, even though the chance of an individual one collapsing is very low. And the thing about this GRW collapse then is it only takes one of these particles, one of these uh, particles to collapse dynamically giving the GRW dynamics. And I'll collapse the whole of this state onto either this, uh, or this. And so this is meant to be um, a way of getting across or conveying the idea of this collapse, which people like Dirac had, but in a way which doesn't invoke the notion of measurement. It's much more precise. It's much cleaner. It says there are other dynamics. Any quantum mechanical system has a very small probability of collapsing, um, which means being hit by this Gaussian function, which will suppress a term in the superposition. This is very unlikely to happen for a microscopic system like an electron, but it's very, very likely to happen for a macroscopic system like a, um, like a measuring device or uh, any other macroscopic system with many degrees of freedom. Um, and so the GRW dynamics will say that uh, with overwhelming likelihood, which is essentially unity, I will not see this. I will just see one of the two terms of the superposition because it would only take one of the particles in the measuring device to collapse dynamically for the whole of this to collapse onto either this or this. Which I always found pretty neat when I was first presented with it. Um, I should probably pause to make sure that the idea is clear to people because maybe I, I just want to check I didn't go through that too quickly. If, do people have questions about the GRW dynamics? We have some, um questions um, in the chat, but those might be better suited for the end. Um, okay. If anyone has any specific GRW, oh yeah, uh, Clem asks, does GRW imply that there is a small but finite chance that we can find a macroscopic superposition? Yes, is the answer, yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's one thing. It doesn't guarantee that you will have collapsed uh, your macroscopic superposition onto this or this. It just says the chances are ridiculously high that you will have collapsed onto this or this, given the number of atoms in your measuring device. And I suppose in this kind of, this is just to do with that, uh, Jonah Anton asks, um, what if you had a microscopic measuring device? Um, uh, yeah, fair enough. And then you would also have to just say that the chances of it still being in a superposition are reasonably high. I think that's a good question and that's the honest answer. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, the others um, are a bit more general, so maybe we'll come back to those later. Sounds great. Um, cool. So uh, hopefully the idea of GRW is relatively clear then. There's a, another thing which really deserves to be stressed though, which is uh, the GRW collapse dynamics, as I said, is take your quantum state, 
at any time there's a certain chance of it being hit by a certain Gaussian function like this dotted thing which I've drawn. You might ask, well, why did they choose a Gaussian function rather than something which would have made the state even more localized, like a delta function? Why didn't I just choose my claps to be a delta function like this, to collapse it exactly onto this position? The reason is that uh, if you do that, then it turns out that GRW will predict that electrons will fly off the orbits of atoms uh, and so on and so forth, and matter won't be stable and so on, which is not great. Uh, so they can't say that the collapse is as specific as given by a delta function because the theory would cease to be empirically adequate. Um, rather, they have to have a more relaxed collapse function, which is this delta function with a certain characteristic uh, width. Um, and you can tune things just right such that GRW most of the time, or the overwhelming majority of the time, makes the same predictions as, as quantum mechanics. But it is important to stress that this dynamics actually does change change stuff. So it's not exactly empirically equivalent to quantum mechanics. But the problem with multiplying by a Gaussian rather than say a delta function is what I wrote here, that you don't actually completely kill this term in your superposition. And so there's a sense in which uh, even if my state, when I go back to this thing, has collapsed onto either this branch or this branch, actually uh, you haven't completely got rid of the state, it just has very, 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 very small amplitude. Um, and so there's a charge to be made that GRW theory hasn't given you everything that you would, might want from it. It hasn't told you that this is not physical, that only one of these terms is physical. All it's done is updated the amplitudes of these two branches, but it hasn't completely got rid of one of them. Um, this is the uh, notorious uh, problem of the tails of GLW theory, and there's a lot to be said about this. Um, the reason it's tail, the problem of tails, if I go to this diagram, uh, this tail is still here, basically. I didn't completely destroy it. Um, there are tweaks that you can make, so I might go for something between a collapse onto a delta function and a Gaussian, like maybe a Gaussian with compact support, like I just cut, cut off its legs. Uh, so, sorry, too violent imagery, but uh, cut off the two ends of the Gaussian. Uh, and then I would uh, completely destroy this. So I would just ignore this uh, and ignore this. And then I could say that my state is well localized over here. Um, the issue with doing that kind of thing is it's very difficult to make that kind of collapse function consistent with relativity theory. So to give a general re or a special relativistic version of GRW theory. Um, there have been some really fun other discussions of how to solve the problem of the tails or how uh, GLW theorists might address this. Uh, good reference here, very fun to read, is by David Wallace, who's kind of the most famous philosopher of physics around. He used to be at Oxford, but now he's in the States. He has a paper called Life and Death in the Tails. of the GRW wave function. I'll just write. Um, and his argument is that if I think about what will go on for people in this, uh, imagine I've got a superposition of say, my seeing um, the electron in spin up and my seeing the electron in spin down or my being over here versus my being over there. So maybe I'll stick with position and say, this is the superposition of my being over in one place versus my being in another place. Anyone who's in the term of the superposition, which is suppressed by the GRW interaction, Wallace argues, in fact, won't experience the same physical things as if they were not hit by the GRW uh, collapse function. Uh, sort of similar to what I was saying before, the fact that GRW has empirically distinct consequences to ordinary quantum mechanics. Um, what Wallace argues is that uh, people in this branch um, will uh, be subject to radiation and uh, all sorts of other unpleasant effects and would very quickly die. Uh, and so there's an anthropic argument to be made that you could only ever experience one of these terms of the superposition, even if both of them actually exist. So this is sort of similar to an anthropic argument from cosmology. You might ask, why is it the case that the constants of nature are what they are? And people sometimes answer, well, if they weren't what they were, then we wouldn't be able to exist. Um, and the thought here similarly is, why is it the case that I only ever experience 
the term of the GRW wave function, which has relatively high amplitude. And the answer is, if you were on this one, you'd very quickly die. Uh, this is controversial, but it just goes to show the kind of, or very controversial, but it just goes to show the kind of uh, fancy footwork that GLW theorists might have to go through in order to resolve the problem of the tails, in order to somehow argue that uh, <coughs> I can effectively neglect this part of my GLW wave function, even though it's still there after collapse using a Gaussian. Um, did any other questions on GLW come up in the chat? Um, there's more general discussion again. It's yeah, a, it's a very discussion-heavy was... topic. Yeah, yeah, I'll um, just carry on. No, but there's actually some, some GRW related things. So, um, someone asking about the Gaussian and why we're picking that one. Um, but I guess you kind of went into it. Um, I think I remember there was something about energy conservation that, that we chose that particular one. Is that, am I making yeah. that up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you want you want to choose your Gaussian so that um, basically the physics comes out right. Uh, mm. and so it is kind of reverse engineered, and that some people I think there's a case to be made that this is another oddity of GLW that you kind of chosen your Gaussian wave function to give you just what you wanted. Another thing to say is that the Gaussian, in terms of its characteristic width and also the time scale on which the GLW collapse occurs, um, this involves introducing two new constants of nature. Uh, in addition to the three that we have, which seems kind of profligate. So uh, another reason to maybe be a bit concerned about GRW. Yeah, that was the other question was whether the likelihood is, is just a fundamental constant. Um, exactly. So exactly. yes, we're introducing quite a few there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so I think what I want to say about GRW is it's definitely cleaner and more precise than the claps of the kind that Dirac and von Neumann were talking about. It doesn't invoke problematic notions of measurement but it is certainly not without its own conceptual problems. Uh, and a lot of it, yeah, these are these technical physics problems, like how much should we be concerned about the fact that I have to introduce two more constants of nature. Also these problems of tails, like what am I to make, how am I to make sense even of a state like this with small but nevertheless non-vanishing amplitude of one of the two branches. Nice, so yeah. I will go on. Sorry. Someone very quickly, I just, I think you'll come back to that. But when you use the word branches, they were wondering if you were referring like to the many worlds interpretation, but yeah, I appreciate I'm, we're trying not to do that. <laughs> I'm use, I'm, I hope I'm not cooking the books too much. I'm just using, uh, uh, yeah, many worlds term, terminology. Maybe I shouldn't do that. Just, you can just use the words term of superposition instead at this point. Uh, yeah, I'm sure we'll come back to that later. Awesome. All right, I think that's it for now. Awesome, cool, thank you. So yeah, that was our option of um, thinking that Schrodinger evolution was not invariably correct. Now I'm going to talk about the second thing, which would be deny, to deny this first thing, that the wave function is a complete description of reality. Um, as I said, this involves introducing what are known as hidden variables. These are extra physical degrees of freedom, which are not modeled or which go beyond um, the quantum mechanical wave function. So um, if you're a hidden variable theorist, I mean, the standard story that we get from quantum mechanics when we study it in a physics department is that you have uh, Heisenberg uncertainty relations, a system can't be in a determinate state of position and momentum at the same time, for example. But if you're a hidden variable theorist, what you can say is it can, it's just that there are extra degrees of freedom which are not modeled by quantum mechanics, which are not captured in the formal, in the, in the, structural core of quantum mechanics. Um, and there are many different ways of implementing or, or going about a hidden variable theory. Um, but the most popular by far is uh, known as the de Broglie-Bohm pilot wave theory. This was first proposed by Louis de Broglie in the 20s, but then developed substantially by David Bohm in the 1950s. Um, and the idea here is that we take quantum mechanics, we take there to be a wave function, we take this wave function to be governed by the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. But in addition, we think that there are other degrees of freedom. There are other physical objects or quantities. These objects are uh, Bohmian corpuscles which is just the name that people use for the extra thing that they introduce, which is really just classical point particles. Um, 
in addition to the wave function of quantum mechanics. And the wave function is going to guide the motions of these classical point particles, uh, hence the term pilot wave theory. So the wave is, is the, the pilot of the, uh, of the Bohmian corpuscles. Um, and the thought is that by adding these extra elements of my ontology, uh, the things that I'm committed to in reality, that's sorry, philosopher's jargon for what we believe exists, uh, I can resolve the problems of the, the measurement problem as I presented it as well, and I can make sense of that state. So let me say a bit more about how this works. So um, I'll write out a little of uh, the structure of Bohmian mechanics. So the ontology, the stuff that the theory commits us to, uh, is given by both psi and corpuscles which are classical point particles with determinate positions given by Q1, Qn. Dynamics are given by TDSE, time dependent Schrodinger equation for psi, and what's known as a guidance equation, which is the equation of motion for the corpuscles, which looks like this. dqi by dt is equal to h bar over m, where m is the mass of the ith particle times the imaginary part of the gradient of the wave function divided by Sorry. Um, just to say a little bit about Bell. So one of the upshots of Bell's theorem, um, which is super famous and follows on from the EPR paradox, is that there cannot be a local hidden variable theory. Um, and you can immediately see how Bohmian mechanics is uh, consistent with that. The theory is transparently non-local because how my particular particle, my ith corpuscle behaves, you can see as a function of uh, the positions of all of the other particles in the universe. Uh, and so how this guy moves at one particular point in space, in order to determine that, you have to consider the, the positions of all of the particles everywhere else in the universe, regardless of how close they are to that corpuscle. Uh, and so that's, I think, a reasonably clear illustration using the guidance equation of the sense in which Bohmian mechanics is a non-local hidden variable theory and is therefore consistent with Bell's theorem. Um, there's also a probabilistic rule, which is that the probability of us finding a corpuscle in any given place is given by the Born rule. So I would write the probabilistic hypothesis probability of Q1 being at position X1 and then Qn being at position Xn is given by the mod squared of the uh, state. Note that this isn't a statement about reality. This, uh, so this is what you might call an epistemic probability. It's a probability about us and what we find rather than the dynamics of the universe actually containing anything stochastic like the GRW case. So the nature of the probabilities in these two approaches is very different. The dynamics here are not probabilistic in a way that the dynamics of um, GRW theory are probabilistic. And some people don't like this. They think it's just a bare assertion about the Bohmians make. Um, there's a lot to say here, and maybe we can talk about that more later. Um, but OK, so if I go back to my, my uh, unhappy state from the start, so that was uh, the structural core of quantum mechanics says that post measurement I will have a state like this. Ooh, that should not be. That's not power. Our question was how to make sense of this. Well what would a Bohmian say? Well they would say if I if I schematically model my uh, Stern Gallant experiment like this, so 
my electron, which I will take to be represented or associated with some corpuscle, goes into my measuring device. Uh, corpuscles have determinate positions at all times. And so either the electron will end up coming out of this slot or it will end up coming out of the other one. But there's a fact about which slot it goes out of. And so the hidden variable theory and the corpuscle and the position of this corpuscle, which is associated with the electron, it's not in the quantum state at all, but that is going to be sufficient to tell me this is the right one. This is the one that the, where the corpuscle lives. This is this, what the quantum state is telling me, that the post-measurement state of the electron is up. That's indeed the one which is correlating with uh, where this corpuscle actually goes as given by the guidance equation. And so the extra stuff, the, the corpuscles and the guidance equation, uh, to use the language that I used before, allow you to break the symmetry between the two branches of this quantum state and say that this is the, this is the real one. This is the, where the corpuscle actually ends up. This is actually um, what the state of my electron is post-measurement. Um, there are some very, very cool diagrams about how a Bohmian would deal with the double slit experiment, which some of you will have been familiar with. If, if you use the guidance equation and think about initial positions of various corpuscles and then how they go through the double slits, the corpuscles have determinate positions at all times. And so you'll find that they're very sensitive to the initial position. And so they'll go through like this. Never overlapping in their trajectories, by the way, this is just my horribly insensitive whiteboard. Uh, what you'll end up getting is something which looks like an interference pattern, even though it's really not an interference pattern. Uh, you just have corpuscles which are behaving in very weird ways, uh, very uh, non-classical ways given the guidance equation, which thereby recover the structure of what looks like an interference pattern here. Which is, I think, very cool. Uh, so they have lots of uh, interesting stories to say about how all of our familiar quantum mechanical experiments are working um, in terms of their fundamental ontology, which consists of Bohmian corpuscles. OK, so that's the gist of Bohmian mechanics. Uh, once again, there are many, many uh, problems or concerns with this view. Um, is people have, do people have questions about the structure of the theory? Is, was, did anything come up in the chat up so far? Um, yeah. Again, some of the general questions. Um, is that, you know, I, I don't want to distract you and then like, you have to come back to your main talk. So I think we'll keep those to the end. Um, I, I guess, seem a bit more general. Nice, okay. So let me, let me, um, tell you some of the problems with Bohmian mechanics that some people have latched onto. I think that some of these are more serious than others. Um, and then we'll go on to the final approach, which I wanted to tell you about, which was the many worlds approach to quantum mechanics. So um, here is a list of four issues which you might raise with Bohmian mechanics, and there are others as well. Um, the first, and I think this is the least serious, is that the guidance equation, as I wrote it down on the previous slide or a few slides ago is a first order equation, which some people think is odd. If I think about like Newtonian mechanics or a Klein-Gordon equation or other things, it seems like most uh, dynamical equations in physics are second order equations. Uh, some people might say, well, it's at least weird that Bohmian mechanics has this different kind of equation, but I think the right response from a Bohmian is simply, so what, why is that a problem? Um, so I'm not tremendously convinced by this one, although it is something that people raise. Um, the second is, uh, some people say that it violates what's known as the action-reaction principle. The reason, or what's, what people are thinking here is that the wave function tells you how your corpuscles will move, but the corpuscles don't similarly have any back effect on the wave function. Um, another example, which sometimes people bring up here is consider space-time structure in Newtonian mechanics or in special relativity. So in the latter case, Minkowski space-time structure. There's a debate in the philosophy of physics about whether you should regard this as actually existing or not. Um, 
And the reason that some people don't like this kind of structure is because, again, it seems to violate the action reaction principle. It seems to play an important role in telling you kind of the inertial motions of bodies, how bodies will behave. But the bodies in turn don't uh, go back and tell you anything or have any back effect on uh, how space time will behave. Note that this is very different in the context of general relativity, where you would say that the action reaction principle is actually satisfied. Uh, and to use uh, uh, Wheeler's famous expression, uh, space time tells matter how to move, matter spells, tells space time how to curve. So clear satisfaction of the action reaction principle here, uh, but not in the case of, say, physics in Newtonian mechanics or special relativity when it comes to space time. Similarly, not in the case of uh, Bohmian mechanics when it comes to the relationship between the corpuscles and the wave function. Um, I think this is better than the first response, but again, I'm not super convinced by it. I would be happy to solicit your views. Uh, I think there's room to say again, well, maybe I don't care about the action reaction principle. As long as the Bohmian mechanics gets around those issues with, quantum with the uh, structural core of quantum mechanics, uh, and makes the correct empirical predictions, why should I care about this uh, highbrow philosophical principle? Okay, so maybe uh, these criticisms are not doing uh, so well so far. Um, the third one will make more sense in a few minutes. This is a claim which was raised by um, two Oxford philosophers, David Wallace, who I've already mentioned, and Harvey Brown, uh, who's recently retired philosopher of physics at Oxford. And this is that it is many worlds or Everettian quantum mechanics in denial. Uh, in fact, this was first raised uh, in passing by David Deutsch, uh, a physicist at Oxford, uh, who said, yeah, the problem with Bohmian mechanics is it's uh, many worlds theory in the state of chronic denial. What were they thinking here? Uh, well, they were thinking that, you know, in Bohmian mechanics, I still have this state. Um, and I just have introduced this extra degree of freedom, which picks out one of the terms in the state as being the real one. But I have not said that the other, or the one where they're somehow privileged, but what I have not done is uh, said that this is not real. Um, I've still got both of the terms of the superposition. It's just that I've said that somehow this is privileged. And so if you're a many worlds theorist, you would be inclined to say, well, I've still got both of the terms of the superposition then. So I've still got two worlds. So just adding this extra degree of freedom, which basically allows me to like add a star or like a smiley face to one of the two branches is not sufficient to get rid of this guy. Uh, that's what Deutsch and Brown and Wallace have in mind. And I think that that one is harder to deal with. Um, the fourth uh, is that, in fact, if you think about things hard enough, the corpuscles have no properties. Uh, what do I mean by this? I mean, consider I, I've got some corpuscle which is following a trajectory like this. Uh, and suppose that it's like a corpuscle associated with an electron um, and so uh, has some charge, electromagnetic charge. Suppose I turn on a magnetic field over here, but the magnetic field is zero wherever the corpuscle is. Um, then uh, it turns out that the motion of the corpuscle will still be affected. Uh, so the corpuscle will still go a different way after I turn on this electromagnetic field, which is nowhere where the trajectory of the corpuscle is. This was discussed mostly in the context of neutron interferometry experiments in the 90s. And the conclusion which uh, people drew here is that then I might think that um, say the property of charge is associated with this corpuscle, but it really seems to be more like it's in the wave function because the wave function lives everywhere, including where the magnetic field is. And so it makes sense that if I turn on my magnetic field, it would affect the charge if I think that the charge is associated with the wave function because the wave function lives here. It doesn't make so much sense to think it would affect anything to do with the corpuscle if the corpuscle is nowhere where the magnetic field is. Um, drilling down into these arguments is again some also somewhat Delicate. I, if I were to give you my rank order, I think that this is third one is the biggest criticism. This one is 
interesting, but I think it's somehow somewhat hard to make sense of thinking about where properties live or something. So um, it needs to be spelled out more. And I'm not super convinced by one or two, um, but people have different views. Uh, suffice it to say that Bohmian mechanics has its own issues, just like GRW. Uh, again, to put my own cards on the table, I think that Bohmian mechanics is probably doing slightly better than GRW theory. Okay, so our third option, uh, I'm conscious of time, it would be good to have um, some time to discuss as well. Our third option is to have your cake uh, and eat it. We had uh, our three things. It seemed like you couldn't have um, the quantum state being a complete description of reality and the time dependent Schrodinger equation being the only dynamics and having determinate measurement outcomes. Um, but maybe in fact you can. Uh, and that's the claim from many worlds theorists or Everettians um, following in the work of Hugh Everett who wrote about this first in the 1950s. So if I take my state, the state which we always regarded as being problematic, it was this, I've written this out a few times now. Maybe you can take this literally and you can take it to be the case that quantum mechanics is actually telling you that there's a bit of the wave function where you, your measurement device and in turn you, because you can imagine this in turn entangling with you as well. So you've got U C spin up plus R up plus up plus U C spin down plus R down plus down. Maybe there's a bit of the wave function where you see spin up. Uh, and there's a bit of the wave function where you see spin down. Um, if, if you can somehow make that precise, uh, if in particular one can argue that the U that sees anything in this part of the wave function is not sensitive to anything which goes on over here, then maybe there's a way of recovering the fact that we see determinate measurement outcomes in Everettian i.e. many worlds quantum mechanics you never you're never sensitive to anything like this you're kind of dynamically decoupled from it so you only see the stuff which is over here which explains why you observe determinate measurement outcomes and there are uh technical results in quantum mechanics just the physics of quantum mechanics nothing interpretative which come from the 80s, which allow us to say things like this. So the buzzword here is decoherence. And this is really what uh, makes the Everett interpretation, the many worlds interpretation, something which people these days are willing to buy into. Decoherence is effectively the dynamical suppression of uh, interference effects um, between terms of a superposition. So if I start off with some state, like psi uh, is equal to alpha a plus beta b. Suppose that this interacts with some bigger system whose state I will represent by phi. Uh, so I'll take phi to be effectively, like you can treat it like a measurement by. So in fact, maybe I'll just call it r. Um, Okay, so one piece of formal machinery, which is useful for people, I realize I might be trying to do too much too quickly here, but one piece of formal machinery, which is useful to people is what's known as a density matrix. Uh, and a density matrix is very useful for a bunch of reasons, but one of the reasons that it's useful is that it encodes not only what the terms of your superposition are, but also the degree of interaction between the terms of the superposition. And effectively you compute a density matrix by taking what's known as the outer product of your state, uh, which in this case is going to look like mod squared alpha and then alpha star beta and then beta star alpha and then beta star, sorry, beta mod squared beta. So suppose that's, that's the density matrix associated with this state psi and you can see in general uh, there will be interference. The interference is represented by the off diagonal elements of your, your superposition. The terms in the superposition can be understood to be associated with the on diagonal elements. 
And so if I could somehow explain that when my system interacts with this measuring device, the off diagonal terms will vanish uh, or will become dynamically suppressed, um, I would have a way of saying that that first term of the superposition just won't be sensitive, won't interact with the second term of the superposition. Um, and you can do this. So if I compute the density matrix of this system after interacting with this measurement device, what I'll get is a new density matrix. By the way, again, if you want to see the maths here, I think it's around page 87 of Wallace's excellent 2012 book, which is called The Emergent Multiverse. Uh, what you will find is something like If it were the case that my states, my pointer states of my measuring device, R alpha and R beta, or to use the terminology which I was using before, R up and R down, are orthogonal to one another, then these two pieces would be zero. And that would immediately kill the interference effects between the terms of the superposition. But even if it's the case that the terms, my pointer states are not orthogonal to one another, if I consider for example, a small particle which is constantly interacting with stuff in its environment, what you can consider, or mathematically what's happening is exactly this again. Um, and every time my small particle, say, bumps into another particle or a bigger particle, it will effectively um, undergo an interaction like this. And even if my pointer states are not orthogonal to one another, if I consider many, many, many such interactions, the density matrix of the original system that I was looking at will be the same thing, but where these things are now to the power of n, where n is the number of interactions. Even if these things are not orthogonal, so they're greater than zero, they've got to be between zero and one. Uh, and so if I have more and more interactions, as my particle is bumping into more and more stuff, dynamically what's happening is the interference effects between the terms uh, of its superposition are, are being dynamically suppressed. Um, and they cease to interact with one another, and that is the phenomenon of decoherence. Uh, and once that's happened, you have a good story to be told about how nothing over here is interacting with anything over there. What you've effectively got is two classical states. Um, and here's really where the, the many worlds theorist kicks off. They say, well, that's the, that's the basis on which I can say that this is dynamically autonomous from this, quantum mechanics is just telling me that there are two states, one in which I see spin up and one in which I see spin down. And I should really flag that decoherence isn't, uh, I should really just stress that decoherence isn't anything which is particular to an interpretation of quantum mechanics. It's something which is true in what I've called the structural core of quantum mechanics. So it's something which everyone has to agree uh, is a true feature of reality. Um, there are very, this is by no means to say that the Everett interpretation is uh, on safe footing though. So one thing which you will have noticed is lacking is uh, where do probabilities come from? Uh, why is it the case that I see probabilistic outcomes of quantum mechanical experiments as given by the Born rule? Um, and James, I think we lost you there for a couple of seconds. Can you just repeat the last oh, yeah. sentences or something? Uh, yeah, sorry, I, I don't know where you lost me, but so, okay, so let me just back up a tiny bit. So uh, decoherence is something which is a phenomenon which holds in uh, just the structural core of quantum mechanics. It does not, it's not anything which is particular to a specific interpretation of quantum mechanics. Um, and therefore, it's something which everyone, regardless of their approach to quantum mechanics, whether they're a GLW theorist or a Bohmian or an Everettian, has to agree exists. But it's nevertheless super important for the Everettian because it's this which allows them to say which you have two autonomous branches uh, which are not going to exhibit quantum, quantum mechanical interference effects between themselves. And so which are not going to be sensitive to what's going on in the other one. Um, 
And this is the basis on which they say you have two robust quasi-classical worlds here. Um, not to say that Everettian and quantum mechanics is without its problems. So if the universe has this branching structure where there's one branch where I see spin up and one branch where I see spin down, um, why is it that I observe probabilistic outcomes of quantum mechanical experiments? And what can that mean in this deterministic but branching picture? Um, there are kind of two issues with probability. The first is, is the notion of probability even coherent in an Everettian many worlds universe where all of the outcomes happen? Uh, what is it uh, that's there to assign probabilities to? And the second is uh, a more quantitative issue. Uh, how do I recover the born rule probabilities in particular? Why is it that if I've got some two terms in a superposition where they're, they're different weights, why is it that I see the one with a higher weight more than the second one? Uh, not obvious what an Everettian, what a many worlds theorist is going to say in response to that question. Um, many worlds theorists have tried super, super hard to answer these questions, and they've come up with very many, very elaborate, and to my mind, well, fascinating, but also odd in various ways, uh, uh, approaches to this question. I'd be very happy to talk about those uh, in the discussion. Um, I guess I'll just say one more thing on Everettian approaches now, which is one thing which you might come to mind, which might come to your mind is where are the other branches? Um, remember that the wave function uh, is governing physical goings on in four dimensional space. Uh, and so there's a sense in which the other branches are right here. It's just that you're not interacting with them. So when you do your measurement, you see, say, spin up. There's just another version of you exactly where you are, but which you is seeing spin down. And just like it would be the case that if there are a particle in particle physics, which didn't couple to any of the particles that you were made out of at all, you would never be sensitive to that particle. The same kind of thing goes across with the Everettian. You're just not dynamically coupled to this other branch in any way, so you just don't notice it, um, which is odd, I think, um, but worth stressing. So let me go back to my, uh, to my uh, tripartite list. We've seen, wait, where is this thing? We've seen that uh, many worlds theorists try to embrace all of these three things at uh, one time. I guess the issue for them there is really justifying that you get determinate measurement outcomes. And if you bundle this in determinate probabilistic measurement outcomes, that's really the challenge that they face. If they can't explain how this works, then their approach isn't gonna fly. Um, on the other hand, a hidden variable theorist would deny the first one. They would say there are more degrees of freedom in reality than those given to us by quantum mechanics. Um, and a dynamical collapse theorist would do, deny this one. Um, but I think that uh, hopefully we're all agreed that uh, even though they face problems, these approaches are interesting, distinct, much clearer than the Feynman position would suggest. Uh, and so I think we should stop uh, telling ourselves that quantum mechanics is fundamentally incomprehensible. I think that we can do a much better job than that. Um, but yeah, thank you everyone for listening and I'm very keen to answer or discuss any of the issues which have come up. Thank you so much, that was a great talk. Um, yeah, uh, I think that's a, that's a good message. I, I often think that people kind of say, oh, nobody understands quantum mechanics to kind of end the conversation that you're having. Um, yeah. Even when it, you know, maybe you, are, you have gone in a circle once, but you are kind of still, you know, getting at something. Um, so it's great, great point. Um, okay, let's open it up to questions. Um, I guess I can start going back in the chat and like addressing some of the previous ones. James, can you see the chat as well? So, you know, if it's uh, a long I'll question. Bring it up sorry. Now. Um, I see there are many comments. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. I'm just going to try to find the ones that I skipped earlier. Um, all right. Uh, someone asked if we have to worry about how to what 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 a system is, how we define it, um, because they are particularly interested whether um, a system of two electrons being very far away would even be a system would even be a system, and if if not, then we wouldn't have to worry about the EPR paradox. Um, I think that was Alexandros. Um, I see we have our brief people back. <laughs> 
they appeared a couple of a while ago. That's who this uh, I assume <laughs> from the name. Okay, yeah. So, um, what does the system mean? I think to some extent it's semantic, um, but I would say anything which is um, which you can model in quantum mechanics, and that might be an entangled state of an electron being here or, or over there. Let's just uh, be very liberal and describe anything which I can modify, model in quantum mechanics as being a system. Um, so in that sense, we don't need to worry about it. Anything which is consistent with the structure of quantum mechanics is going to be within the remit of our discussions. Okay. I think another thing to say is that, I mean, it is important to recognize that measurement devices and humans are things which in principle can be modeled in quantum mechanics as well. We are made out of atoms. We can also be described orbit in the schematic way that I've been doing as quantum mechanical systems. Um, one can in one's mind bracket all of these issues about quantum mechanics if you don't start thinking about modeling measurement interactions themselves in quantum mechanics, but you should be able to do that because there's no reason why not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, and we have someone, Sahila posted a rather long comment on, I think at some point you mentioned that some people try to cop out um, of the whole problem by saying, oh, it's consciousness that collapses the wave function. And yep. that's also, and then they kind of also use that as a definition of consciousness and also as a way to solve the measurement problem sometimes. <laughs> um, uh, so, Hila, I think you, so you wrote a bit, uh, quite a bit about um, like an extension of the Schrodinger's cat experiment and how that kind of shows us how that's not coherent. If you have a question, do put it in the chat and I'll read out and we can come back to that. Um, if anyone's interested, do find the paragraph in the chat. Um, it's a bit long. So I, I won't go into it in detail yet. Um, let's see what else we have. Uh, I think that's all the major ones from earlier. Um, uh, Diana is asking about uh, the subject of quantum Darwinism and the underlying wave collapse to some proper point of states um, to describe the macroscopic world. Uh, I think it really suits some of the other questions ideas as well. Okay, do you want to do you want to go into that? Um, so I don't know if Diana's around. Maybe Diana can say a bit about what she understands by quantum Darwinism. Or not? I'm we'll sure. we'll keep an eye on the chat. Um, Christy asks. Why was point four an issue if we assumed the theory to be non-local? Now I think that was in this when in response to Fermi mechanics. Uh, yes, yeah. So I think that's a reasonable concern that you could have as this being a problem for the theory. Um, we already said that the theory was non-local. Um, so I yeah, this is what's part of the reason why I'm not so convinced. Um, there seem to be some locality assumptions to say, you know, if this is affecting what's going on over here, then all of the properties which this affects must be over here. And so the properties must be in the wave function as well, rather than in the corpuscle. But that surely implicitly presupposes some locality assumption that uh, it can't be the case that what's over here just non-locally affects what's over there. So um, I think that whoever made this comment is making a reasonable point in objection to this particular uh, argument against Bohmian mechanics. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, I hope this answers the question. If you have like follow up questions to questions I um, asked, then you put them in the chat. I'll try to catch them. Um, Maybe just quickly, else if anyone is interested, I'll just say two my two favorite books. Oh right, that's something we always try to ask at some point. Um, so the first, <laughs> yeah by Albert called Quantum Mechanics and Experience, which is from Harvard University Press in 1990, I think. So actually pretty early on in these discussions. Um, and then more recent is Tim Maudlin's book, um, Philosophy of Physics QM, which is a more up-to-date um, approach. This came out just last year, actually. And Maudlin uh, is very much a Bohmian and he hates Everettian quantum mechanics. So you will get a very uh, 
very clear and very illuminating, but not exactly unbiased approach uh, to the subject. Uh, then I guess on the other hand is Wallace, who's like the polar opposite. So pro Everett and anti uh, Bohmian mechanics. So he has a book, which I already mentioned, called The Emergent Multiverse, which is Oxford from 2010. 2012, and this is Princeton, 2019. So th yeah, they think these are definitely the best three intro books um, to the philosophy of quantum mechanics, um, and definitely readable, especially for anyone that's done even the you know a few lectures in QM, you should be fine. Um, I'll try to put those in the uh, comment section of the YouTube um, uh, video once we put that up, so people can find us there as well. Uh, great. Uh, any more questions, you can put them in the chat and I'll try to pick them up. Um, I don't know the delay, some people are watching on the Facebook screen. We now have some places on the Zoom call, so if you want to pop over, maybe you'll be in just in time to ask your question. <laughs> um, I have a quick question. I don't know, maybe I should ask that to an experimental physicist. But um, So you mentioned uh, uh, GRW um, theory. And that was, I don't know, this was a while ago, but I, when I kind of looked into the whole problem, I was quite fascinated by objective collapse theory. Um, and obviously this is the one that, like, the big one, the one that's actually, you know, where they actually had like a, a rigorous um, theory behind it. Uh, and then I also think Penrose at some point kind of just, he didn't go into details, but he just kind of postulated, yeah. what if um, the kind of stability of my superposition is not um, related to the kind of number of particles like GRW you proposed, but it uh, has to do with kind of how um, how different the um, mass displacement is. And then this kind of is kind of a, a threshold where um, like the curvature of space time becomes so great that kind of the, the system becomes unstable. It was very rough, but I found it quite interesting. Mm -hmm. So um, it seems to me that those objective collapse theories could be somewhat tested by kind of seeing how how uh, superposition kind of scales, how the lifetime of superposition scales with um, number of particles and mass. Are you aware of any exper experimental physicists who are kind of looking into this or kind of trying to design some sort of experiment or do you think they just don't care because quantum mechanics works? No, well, I, um, so I, I, first of all, I just agree that these uh, dynamical collapse theories are testable. I think when it comes to GRW, I, as far as I understand it, the deviations from the predictions of orthodox quantum mechanics are very minimal. And I'm, so I'm not sure whether they would in, be within the bounds of it, empirical testability, but I'm not exactly sure about that. Uh, if they were, then it seems like absolutely something that someone should do. I mean, uh, when it comes to the Bell inequalities, people were willing to do like the aspect experiments, which uh, sided with Bell and showed that indeed you couldn't have a local hidden variable theory. Uh, and that's been kind of experimentally shown now. And I don't see why the methodology would be different in this case. When it comes to Penrose's idea, which is also very interesting, which I didn't mention, which is that, as you said, that uh, it's really uh, mass and gravity which collapses the wave function rather than the number of particles. Uh, I just don't know what the experimental bounds are, actually. It should, again, be empir empirically distinct. But yeah, I just don't know. I would like to know. And if, if they are within empirical testability, then um, someone should do it. <laughs> We have a couple of people watching, maybe someone will. <laughs> yeah. um, I'll ask um, maybe an experimental physicist when I get the chance. <laughs> cool, I think so we have an, an, oh, more, more questions in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, okay, Diana is back, uh, trying to, uh, she was asking about quantum Darwinism earlier. Um, let me try to, just to read this out because um, yeah. people watching later won't be able to see this. Yeah. By quantum Darwinism, we can consider that having in mind Darwin's description of evolution based on natural selection, the outcome of so, some characteristics in the macroscopical world, world we see is the result of a pointer state emerged after the decoherence of the others imposed quantum states. Sorry, I'm bad at <laughs> So it is the best fitted state to pop up and it's related to the interaction with its environment. So I guess she's asking for clarification on um, the, the, the term quantum Darwinism um, and how it relates to decoherence. Yeah, I think. So there's a, 
I don't know if this helps Danny, you should say if not, but um, there's the term which you get in the Everetti lit literature of deviant branches, branches in which you get statistics which are very um, non-quantum mechanical in a way. So you could imagine doing a stern gerlach experiment multiple times and just always getting spin up. Um, and that would be, that is a legit branch according to Everetti and quantum mechanics because all of these strings of outcomes will happen. Um, there are nevertheless arguments that these are not branches that uh, we will experience and these arguments go on two fronts. So the first is more similar to the GRW case that somehow we wouldn't be able to survive in these branches. Um, the second is a more technical one that somehow the branches themselves with very low uh, amplitudes are unstable. Um, and so this would again explain why we see uh, mostly statistics which are in accordance with the predictions of, or mostly, you know, quantum mechanical statistics rather than anything on these weird branches. So these are all kind of uh, Darwinian arguments as to why some of the branches are good and some of the branches are bad. Somehow so there's some selection mechanism that some are to be either physically or anthropologically preferred to other ones. Um, yeah, I don't know if that helps, Diana, but there's definitely people have talked about both of these. There's also related stuff. So uh, there's this stuff about quantum immortality that, you know, whatever you do, there's going to be some branch of the wave function where you survive. So uh, uh, you are, yeah, I, I don't, I think this is all a bit far-fetched, but uh, some people talk about this. David Lewis, the philosopher, famous metaphysician, talks about this. I think you may have references to some of the enormous <laughs> I'm, if people want references, you'd be happy to answer it by email as well. Um, I, I, I tried to keep a record and I tried to put them uh, some other people can find it. Um, we're thinking about maybe having um, like a general resource, resource section at some point on our website, so maybe we'll come back to you for the philosophy yeah. recommendations. Um, yeah. um, oh God, more questions. Um, we might have to cut these off at some point, um, but uh, let's, let's do another couple. Um, okay, on the topic of recommendations, um, Dan is asking about recommendations specifically discussing physics and philosophy with respect to uh, like on time and relativity um, and cost again, space time. I think this is because you mentioned earlier that that's actually what you're mostly working on um, yeah. in space time. Yeah. Uh, so. I see. Yeah, I can easily. So the best general intro to the philosophy of space time is again Maudlin. It's his other book, Philosophy of Physics, Space Time, Space and Time. Uh, where he talks about both like whether you should believe that space and time exist based upon the kind of action reaction principle arguments I was talking about before, but also um, things which would be familiar to most of you who have done physics, like what's the best way of explaining why you get twins paradox type differentials when you have two people which follow different paths, um, come back together again, where the person that went away and come back has come back has aged less than the person that stayed on, stayed at home. Um, so Maudlin has really great discussions of all of those uh, issues in the foundations of space and time. Um, but also good discussions about how it is the case that there are going to be problems for certain mainstream views in the philosophy of time um, in light of relativity theory. So um, one annoyingly still popular view is a view called presentism, which says that only present things exist. Um, but it's hard to make sense of that in the context of special relativity, where given the relativity of simultaneity, like is it the stuff relativized to this simultaneity hypersurface or this one or this one? And there doesn't seem to be a good answer to that question. I think this is quite a good argument against presentism. Um, I think actually most people agree, but uh, yeah, Maudlin has a very clear discussion of like why this isn't going to work. Mm -hmm. I don't, yeah, Hin Hinchliffe has a nice paper as well in philosophy of science on, on that particular issue that you asked about, Dan. Um, I'm going to let you uh, take, because some of these questions might be a bit yeah. off topic you want to talk and we have to cut them down anyway. Um, so have a look at anything you want to, you want to pick up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so Ganesh asks, do you think a deterministic description is, of nature is fair or a probabilistic description of nature is fair? Uh, I think, it, I guess, I mean, obvious, I get, yeah, what's to be preferred, like a fundamental dynamics of the universe, which is stochastic, like GRW, or which is deterministic, like Everett. Um, I think nature could be both. There's no reason why nature might not be fundamentally probabilistic rather than deterministic. But I think all other things being equal, I have an aesthetic preference for deterministic theories because I would like to predict what's going to happen in the future rather than just throwing my hands up and saying I can't know. Um, so I would still be inclined, all other things being equal, especially if I had two theories which were both empirically adequate, to prefer an interpretation of quantum mechanics, say, which was deterministic rather than probabilistic. And that's going to put me on the side of either Bohmian mechanics or Everettian quantum mechanics as against GRW theory, or even worse, Dirac von Neumann measurement, collapse on measurement. Uh, So uh, Lasse's question is, I think, um, when does branching occur in Everettian quantum mechanics? Sorry if I'm washing out details from your question. Um, the answer is there's no good answer to that question. Decoherence is an evolving process where terms uh, get more and more suppressed. Um, and so it's not the case ever, and you might, articulate this as a problem for everything in quantum mechanics, it's not the case ever that the off-diagonal terms are completely zero. And so there will still be some interaction between branches. So what the Everettian needs to do is to give a story about how what, in, what interference remains between the branches is somehow dynamically negligible. Um, but you have then a much more vague but murky picture of kind of imagine my branches here, but like blur your, where is it? Yeah, here, but blur your eyes it's kind of blurry where exactly branching occurs. It's more like this, where things get weaker and weaker. Uh, and then the question is really, is this okay? And I think it's okay. Uh, we're used to neglecting terms in our physical equations all the time. And it's normally on the basis of kind of a comparison of magnitudes or something. So I think what the Everettian would want to say here is that I can, treat these as being two separate branches when all of the physical goings on within one branch swamp the interference effects between branches. Um, but spelling this out is yeah, a delicate business. Um, then uh, Clem's question, doesn't branching require a plane of simultaneity as well? I think no, because um, branching is local. You can imagine branching happening just here. This is kind of coming back to what I said before. So when my measuring system interacts with my electron, the branching happens all exactly here. And so I don't need to worry about um, whether or when two spatially separated events are simultaneous or not. I think I'm at... Yeah, so Bohm's theory is non-local, but Bohm's theory is not ever it. The non-locality in Bohmian mechanics comes from the non-locality in the corpuscle guidance equation, um, but there's no thing, there's no such thing in Everettian uh, quantum mechanics. So at least those issues of locality won't arise. I just quickly wanted to say, I just noticed that we missed a question earlier, but that's um, someone asked where quantum mechanics connects with general relativity. And I would like to point them to a string theory talk that we did a while ago. Oh, it's on YouTube. But if you want to say something on, on how quantum mechanics and um, general relativity, um, then do feel free to. Um. There are different ways of putting the incompatibility. One is that quantum mechanics all plays out in the arena of a fixed background space time. And that background space time could be, um, if I'm doing non-relativistic quantum mechanics, like we normally do in our second years, it could be the structure of Newtonian space time where I have absolute space and absolute time. Uh, if I'm doing relativistic, special relativistic quantum mechanics, it would be Minkowski space time. 
Um, normally when people do QFT, they're doing it uh, in a Minkowski space time. That's totally fine as well, but you get into all sorts of problems when you start to try to dynamically couple that space time structure to your matter and to your quantum mechanical matter. And it turns out that, uh, well, people have tried for a long time, but there's no easy and consistent way to do this. Um, what string theory does, just one of the many options, but I probably don't need to tell you this because you've got a whole book on it. You take your background and cost you space time, instead of considering particles on it, you consider strings. You can then eventually consider the vibration modes of those strings and eventually get out both your standard model particles and also other particles, which are so-called gravitons. Uh, and then if I take uh, my background Minkowski space-time, which I call eta, and I consider some graviton terms, eventually this starts to look like the dynamical space-time of general relativity. So that's that kind of fancy way of getting both out from a uh, picture of a fixed background and fundamental strings again. Um, yeah, sorry, super quick. But uh, yeah, so basically you try to couple your quantum mechanical matter to a dynamical metric field and it's going to uh, be inconsistent. So you need to try harder. And there are lots of ways to do this. Of which string theory is just one. Well, thanks for the, for the quick overview. I think that's, that's a question hit by many people. Um, so we have Russell in the, um, in the chat. We um, talked about a bit. So he, I think he's quite uncomfortable with the idea of, um, of many worlds theory and kind of it's it's kind of unsatisfying. Like many people find it unsatisfying to just say, "Oh, it's branches, and we're just in one of the branches, and that's why we only see one outcome." Um, uh, so he's trying to to probe that a bit more. Anything you wanted to add to kind of make it a bit more, um, like I think like less vague is the is the term he would use. Um. I think the reason why people like Everetti and Many Worlds quantum mechanics is because they say look, the structural core of quantum mechanics um, has been tremendously, I think, yeah, so I'm not saying that this is an unproblematic argument, but the structural core of quantum mechanics has been tremendously empirically successful. Quantum mechanics is the best theory of physics that we've ever, ever developed. So we should take it literally um, uh, rather than trying to modify it or add to it, uh, especially if, uh, those modifications or additions are just to avoid some philosophical concern that we don't like many worlds. Um, and so if our physical theory predicts weird things like there being many branches, just deal with it. It's the best that we have. Um, I think that's, there's some truth in that kind of uh, mode of reasoning. So, mm -hmm. and this speaks to a general, I mean, this similar debates come across in, uh, in the special relativistic context about the present that we've mentioned before. So some people are really not happy with this and they say, I must modify or supplement special relativity to have a fact about what the privileged present is. This is a sense in which your kind of philosophical preconceptions of what the world has to be like inform your approach to physical theories. And I just, and many others don't share that mentality. They think that our physics should guide our understanding of the world rather than our preconceptions of our understanding of the world guiding our physics. And so that would be my attempt to, uh, I don't know, assuage these concerns. Wallace mm -hmm. has a passage near the start of his book where he says something like, come on in, the water's lovely. Uh, and <laughs> there's some truth in there. I think that's a, that's a good response. Um, yeah, so thank you, Jeremy. I think the talk was a good, like a really good overview of um, kind of the ways people uh, try to deal with the problems they think quantum mechanics has. Um, so thank you for that. Thank you for everyone who asked questions. Um, and thanks for answering them. No um, it was fun. <laughs> yeah, it was. Um, this talk will be uploaded to YouTube. Amelia, anything we, we want to announce to people? Um, we have these every Wednesday, so yeah. keep <laughs> break. And we also generally have talks on Thursday evenings. We don't actually have one tomorrow. Um, but there will be another one before the end of term. Um, so you can either go follow the Facebook page or sign up to the newsletter and then find out about all the other talks we have, um, which I hope will be just as amazing as the one we just saw. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, Peter, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Great. I think we're good. Right, okay. 
Um, thanks very much for your <laughs> coming and thanks James for giving us this wonderful talk. And again, I will probably see you, uh, see you all audiences next week and perhaps see you James sometime in the future for your another talk. That would be great if you're, yeah. <laughs> um, right. Uh, okay, I will 